Hi, everyone. This is Rob Gray from ASU and the Perception Action Podcast again, back with another article review. So in doing these reviews, what I like to do is to kind of put it in a framework, kind of introduce it with something that connects with something that I'm interested in, I do, and hopefully by by proxy, something that you, uh, listen, people listening, are as well. So I often frame these things in a way different way than you would actually see in the introductions to these papers, right? Because I'm trying to connect them with, with things that I'm interested in or connect them, kind of extend them beyond uh, what was the specifics of the paper. And this is a good example of that because what I want to talk about today is the concept of donor sports or donor sport activities, right? And this was an idea pr proposed by Rene Wormholt and colleagues in, in this really excellent book, The Athletic Skills Model. And their idea here is, is kind of, it's, it has to do with the issue of specialization versus diversification in sports training. So, you know, when you're training as a kid, whether you spend, should spend all the time on your primary sport, whatever that might be, soccer, versus playing multiple sports. And there's all, there's been multiple debates going back and forth about that. You know, another good book which discusses this issue is uh, David Epstein's Range book. Um, but in their their book, um, in the this athletic skills model, the authors uh, are strong supporters of diversification. Specifically, though, they emphasize that there, there are certain sports that might actually um, beyond being giving you more enjoyment and just being fun and giving you something else to do beyond your primary sport, they might actually help in your primary sport. The idea of this donor sport. So a donor sport, you're, the other sport you're doing is donating something to the primary sport and helping you get better in it. And in particular, in their uh, book and the paper on this, they talk about the idea that if the primary sport and the, and the other sport you're doing share uh, overlap in the landscape of affordances, right? They share some commonalities, right? Then you might get this donation effect, right? And another concept that this kind of relates to is one you hear Keith Davids talk about in some of the video, you know, one of the journal clubs he did with me, you know, the idea of learning to learn to move, right? So the idea of learning to uh, uh, respond to affordances, control degrees of freedom, coordinate, is kind of a general skill that might carry over into to other sports, even though it, it might be a different sport. So they illustrate this kind of like with this figure and the main donor sport they talk about in their book and then the, the article that comes associated with this is parkour, right? The idea that parkour can be a good donor sport for team sports like soccer, basketball, uh, football because uh, of the, these shared affordances. So the idea is that in par parkour, you're learning to respond to gaps, right? Judge gaps, explore, take advantage of space, right? And all of those things are useful in team sports, right? So they share this overlap. And this, as I said, this is a general idea that needs to be tested, right? Whether there's actually transfer between parkour and soccer remains to be shown, but it is a very interesting idea. So as I said, uh, this is kind of the framework I want to use for this because I, what I want to do is talk about a paper um, looking at dancers and dance, right? And this paper is obviously interesting in and of its own right. And, you know, dancing is interesting in and of its own right. But as I said, to try to connect it to the sports that I work in and I'm interested in, that's why I wanted to raise the idea of the donor sport, right? And the idea that dance and other kind of um, activities and sports that focus on form more might be a donor sport for uh, for other ones might be a good donor sport and um so i'm going to raise that idea at the end but in this study so this was the study of coy coin colleagues uh published in nature late, late in 2020 um what they were looking at was again the coordinating degrees of freedom and what they were particularly interested in was this you know, this issue I keep raising in a lot of these reviews and discussed a lot on the podcast, this issue difference between good and bad variability, right? Variability that you can take advantage of to have more synergies, uh, to allow for better adjustments, the good variability versus the bad variability that's going to lead to performance problems, right? So their main question they are asking was, does dance training, so people that have experience in dance training, lead to a better uh, use of good variability, stronger motor synergies is another way to, to put it. 
So to, to address this question, what they did was to use a kind of a very interesting task. So they had 10 dancers with at least 15 years of professional dance training versus 10 non-dancers, and they were all female participants. And what they did was they had this dynamic balance task. So they had the person standing, uh, they were being motion tracked, and they were attached to this machine. So they had this thing around their waist, and this machine would unexpectedly, unexpectedly add a perturbation, right? It would suddenly pull you forward, right? So it's going to knock you off balance. So this task is a dynamic balance task. What, what they're doing is reestablishing balance after you get perturbed, right? So you get pulled forward, um, your center of mass, um, your uh, uh, base of stability and gets over your center of mass, right? So if you don't do anything, you'd fall, right? So you need to do some sort of correction. So what they're doing is looking at the how this correction occurs and how it differs for dancers and non-dancers in this very simple. So it's a very nice, well-controlled task. And, the, and obviously the, the machine lets you perturb everyone in exactly the same way. So it's a very uh, you know, consistent design. For this, to analyze the data, what they used is in something I've talked about a lot on the podcast and, and in these videos, uh, the uncontrolled manifold analysis. All right, so to relate, to talk about this again and relate it back to the, if you watched the last video I did, um, looking at the scaling of tennis equipment, I, I talked about the, this kind of terminology of elemental and essential variables, right? So what they're essentially doing is asking, how do the movements of the different body segments, which are the elemental variables, right? The things that are gonna vary, the things that uh, degrees of freedom you have, how do they contribute to the stabilization of the body's center of mass, which is the essential variable, right? That's what you're trying to control, right? So different combinations of elemental variables can result in control of the essential variable, your center of mass, right? And this figure is showing the different um, body segments they looked at. So they looked at the trunk and the legs and the arm, head, so on, right? So that's kind of what we're trying to do, look at the relationship between the elemental variables and the essential variables, and as I've talked about it quite a few times now, what, what happens in uncontrolled manifold analysis, right, is you break the variability in the, um, the variability into good, what's called good and bad variability, right? And th these fi classic figures, sometimes called orthogonal variability and uh, variability along the manifold, UCM. So the way that you think about it, this, and so in, in this task, we want, if, you know, if you're trying to balance, right, we want the variability in the essential variable, right? The, uh, your center of mass to be low, right? If you wanna keep your balance, we don't want a lot of variability in your center of mass, right? Therefore, good variability, um, uh, sorry, if I go first to the bottom one, bad variability, which is task relevant because it, it, we call it task relevant because it actually is going to change, task relevant because it's any variability in the elemental variables that actually does change your center of mass. Right, so if you're trying to change your center of mass, you would need to vary these things, right? Um, if we don't want to vary, ha change our center of mass, we want that to be low, right? We want that variability low or it's gonna change our center of mass and, and make us fall. Good variability is any other variability and sometimes it's called task irrelevant that is not going to change the overall center of mass, right? And you think about this, this is, what we need to stay balanced, right? So if I adjust a bit of my leg movement, big of a hip together to keep my balance, to keep my center of mass from varying, right? And as I said before, this can be represented in these kind of figures where you have, you know, uh, a good variability is, is movement uh, along the manifold, bad variability is, is away from the manifold. And so typically what you see is with, um, before kind of training and early in a task, uh, people have this kind of thing, a pattern, uh, equal amounts of good and bad variability with training and expertise in a task there's becomes less bad variability away from orthogonal to the line more good variability along the line okay so that's what they were looking they're doing kind of standard uncontrolled manifold analysis right what did they find right what were the results okay so pretty straightforward effects but qu but quite interesting so the top graph is showing their measure of the amount of, of task relevant bad variability, right? So variability in your body segments, the elemental variables that are gonna result in a change in the center of mass, right? 
which if you're balanced, like I said, if you're trying to keep stable balance, you don't want your center of mass to change, right? So what you can see is the uh, there's no significant difference between the dancers and non-dancers in terms of this task relevant variability. Next one down is showing the task irrelevant variability. So any change in the elemental variables that you can use that doesn't change the overall center of mass, right? And what you can see is you get a significantly greater amount of this task irrelevant good variability in the dancers. And the graphics are showing you where the significant differences mainly occurred in terms of the actual body segment. So the significant differences were in the coloring is showing you the amount that was used. You, the darker means them used it more. You can see the differences are in the head, the trunk, and in some parts of the leg, right? So people, there's more good variability in that in dancers. And then the last bottom figure is showing their, men, their measure of overall synergy. So synergy is the ratio of good to bad variability, right? Which you want higher. And you can see again, it's significantly higher in dancers, right? Um, and again, they're showing you where it occurred, similar in the head and the, in the, in the legs, we get this difference. Right. So we're getting this, um, you know, very, this was a very straightforward, well, not straightforward, it was complicated analysis, very complicated analysis to do, but the, the result is very straightforward and kind of similar to other uncontrolled manifold analysis. And so what you're seeing is the main conclusion from this is that with dance training, people seem to be better able to take advantage of good variability and balance, right? Which means they're going to have better dynamic balance. They're gonna be able to keep their balance generally better. They're gonna be able to respond to perturbations like being pulled like that better. They're gonna be able to respond to fatigue better uh, and all these different things. So it's it's going to have lots of beneficial effects. And to relate this to some of my work, this is very similar to, to effect I found in, in my recent baseball batting training study. So when I analyzed it was from an older study, what I did in that was look at the good and bad variability in swing timing. And I found that after training, um, batters were more able to exploit good variability. They had a group, more good variability after training, just kind of very similar to the dancers, right? So kind of a very similar effect. With training, we get better used, be able to use good variability, have better motor synergies, right? Which is something Bernstein would, of course, I think would have expected. So tying this all back into the idea of donor sports and pulling this all full circle, um, I've often been asked over the years, you know, if, you know, by parents and things, you know, if you want your kid to play another sport, um, what would be the most beneficial for their main sport, their primary sport? And I've often thought that any kind of sport that emphasizes form, right? So dance, gymnastics, other, figure skating, other activities like yoga, right? I've often thought these would be great donor sports, for a primary sports, a lot of, you know, hockey, baseball, basketball. I think it's a little bit different than what, what um, Ray, Ray Noth and, and Ray Moth in, in their book, Athletic, Athletic Skills Model, were talking about. Because what the reason I think um, this is going to help is not so much that it, it shares the exact same performance. So, uh, you know, same affordances as, um, you know, the main sport, although it does, I know balance, dynamic balance is, is needed in hockey and in soccer, right? But I think it's particularly going to be useful because it's going to increase your sensitivity to different kinds of information, right? Proprioceptive and kinesthetic information primarily, right? Over always being so visual, right? So what I have always thought, and then there's no evidence of this, right? But I think, it, you know, I've always thought that these kind of, these kind of form sports and activities would be great for uh, donor sports because they create new affordances, right? For the new ways to control your balance, new things you can do, new moves you would be able to make in your primary sport, right? So that's the idea I've always had. As I said, it's just kind of speculation. So that's how I, li the, I link these things in my mind. And if you want to know more about this idea of uh, proprioceptive and kinesthetic, uh, you know, it's kind of body awareness, right? I, I covered it back in episode 65 and I showed how it can be measured and the, the evidence that better athletes do have better body awareness and mouth. It also allows them to implement uh, coaching instructions better if you have better body awareness and so on, right? So overall, I think, as, as I said, this was a very interesting study in its own right. I think the methodology and the analysis were, were very straightforward, but very, very interesting. So uh, I would definitely uh, recommend you check it out. So thanks for joining me and cheers for now.